Hi everyone, this is Steve Hargadon and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Wednesday, April 28th, 2010, and we're sure glad to have you with us. Uh, we have a special guest tonight. I want to say Anya Kamenetz, but say, tell me how to pronounce it because I should have asked you in advance. Uh, you know, Kamenetz is probably more correct from a Slavic point of view, but we say Kamenetz. <laughs> Contaminants. So you've yeah. had A's going both directions there. I know, I know. Well, in any case, sure glad to have you here. A lot of fun. Welcome. Happy to be here. So the Future of Education is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate. The project I work on is called Learn Central. It's a social network for educators that is free but has Illuminate baked in. We hope you'll come and enjoy cool. it. And coming up on the Future of Education next week, John Taylor Gatto. A lot of people last night didn't recognize that name, but if you don't know the name, it's worth looking up. He wrote a book called Dumbing Us Down, oh, that a lot yeah. of people know. Um, very interesting man, a little reclusive right now. I had to fax an invitation to him, and he replied by telephone. A lot of fun to talk to him. Uh, the week after that, we've got some fun things coming up, including the Think Global School group. Uh, Kathy Davidson, who's quoted in your book, comes up on May 25th, um, and lots more, uh, including Ted Coldery teachers, partners, lots of fun things. So I hope you'll join us. Not you necessarily, Anya, but others. And in our archives, uh, yesterday, Jackie Gerstein on user-generated education, Randy Orwin on open source, Dr. Robert Epstein on Team 2.0, Tim Magner, Michael Horn, uh, all the way down there. Carl Blythe, I've got his name spelled wrong there, but Car not Carly Blythe, but Carl Blythe uh, at the Texas Language uh, Technology Center. He's going to come up tonight because I actually think his program fits very well with what uh, you've talked about in your book. Um, Sir Ken Robinson, that was a really fun one, and he's up there as well, and lots of others, including Clay Shirky and Dan Pink, who are also quoted in the book, and maybe some others. Uh, it was like reading a who's who in your book. Very <laughs> fun. Okay, we did. We have started Students 2.0. So those of you who are here interested in this idea of students driving their own education, we encourage you to come to that network. I don't see Jackie. There's Jackie and Jenny Luca from Australia are really spearheading this. So please feel free to come in students20.com. Uh, help students find their find ways to connect educationally outside of their traditional organizations. Saturday, June 26th, our annual EduBloggerCon. It's year number four, the All Day On Conference before the ISTE show. Uh, with sponsorship from ISTE, so thanks to them for the space and the wireless. Please feel free to come and enjoy yourselves. Uh, that's really a fun event. If you haven't been, uh, it's the Social Media and Education Unconference, and we have a lot of fun. I think Anya would approve of what we do. Uh, also that same day, for the first time ever, Open Source Con. Uh, ISTE is allowing us to hold that as well, so open source software in K-12. Uh, that same day, Randy Orwin's going to spearhead that for us, and that should be a lot of fun as well. And I think there will be some cross-pollination between the two groups. In November, the first ever global education conference, multiple time zones, multiple languages, five days here in Illuminate for free. Very fun, very exciting, should be a lot of fun. Great organizations are all helping to spearhead this. Um, and the French Embassy has invited me to France in June to begin the process, so uh, a lot of fun for me and my wife. Okay, if this is your first time in Illuminate, we do want to encourage you to participate. It is a participative environment. You'll notice at the bottom of the participant window you can clap. You can do the smiley face. We don't expect any confused looks or thumbs down, but they are there. If you would like to ask a question using the microphone tonight, ask Anya a question, use the hand with the green up arrow icon. That raises your hand and we'll give you the mic. Before you do that, it's good to go up to Tools, Audio, run the Audio Setup Wizard to test your audio. I'm going to recommend also that you go up to View Layouts and switch your layout to the Wide Layout. Uh, for a night like this where there's guaranteed to be a lot of chat, uh, it's easier to read the chat that way and I think you'll uh, find that a little bit easier. You can put uh, notes in the chat window. Do know that even though you can send private notes, they're not entirely private. Anya and I see them as the moderators. Okay, so your first act of participation is now. Look for the wand with the red star at the end. Click on it and then click on the map. Give a shout out in the chat. Let us know where you're listening from. Maybe what the time and temperature are. We did a session today with folks in New Zealand, Europe, 
in North America. Okay, so we've got Hawaii, Peru, North America, Australia. Yeah, a little bit international. And again, wherever you're listening from, or if you're listening to the recording, we're sure glad to have you here with us. Okay, Anya. Oh, I've got one word to say about this book, and it is wow. It's just stunning. Uh, you've given me, I'm going to put this, I know you want to do this. This is going to be my last act before I turn my webcam off. This is the book, DIYU. You've given me six months of interviews to do. <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I kid you not. I, I've circled and underlined all through this book all kinds of people. Oh, is that a little uh, like a spray paint thing? Yeah, it's a stencil. How do you get it's that? A stencil. Well, a stencil. Um, I don't know. I can maybe give it away to one of the people <laughs> in your chat. A yeah. contest. Yeah, having a contest. That? So you'll have to decide how to how to run that contest. Maybe ask a yeah. question in yeah. the book that someone would that, have to about, know. How about best question of the hour? Gets Good. five of these. And you get best to question choose. of the hour. Okay, I get to okay. choose. Okay. Yeah, and and maybe. How about how about the participants get to choose? What's the best question? You run it. Whatever you want to <laughs> do, you run it. I'm gonna turn my webcam off now, but you're still on and live and big. Okay. Hi. Hi. And. Uh, this was fascinating for me because, in part, uh, I started this interview series four years ago interviewing people about open source software and education. And I felt like it completely prepared me for uh, many of the examples that you brought up. In fact, I met David Wiley and, and, and many that you mention in the book and others that you don't. Um, so why don't mm -hmm. you tell us a little first about your own background, you know, kind of what's brought you to this point and, and what led you to write such a stunningly interesting book? <laughs> so I'm a journalist. I am also the product of two professors. My parents both teach at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge and have for seven years. And I started out writing uh, for the Village Voice. I was an intern there, and then I was a uh, reporter there. And I got really started really young on this issue of uh, what we called the new economics of being young. And so I was out of college by a couple of years. I was in New York post 9-11 during the run up to the 2004 presidential campaign, really interested in how our politics were and were not serving young people and writing in a really great newspaper that is now sort of not the same paper it was about the you know these issues about student loans, about credit card debt, and about every movement that America's ever had has been a movement of people sort of standing up for their own interests and why don't young people stand up for their own interests? And so I wrote the book Generation Debt that came out of my column in The Voice that was really addressing these issues of student loans, of credit card debt, of changing in the job market that were affecting my generation. Um, time passed. I became, I, I took somewhat of a role of a student advocate. I was going around to campuses speaking about student loans. And I started to see that the student loan issue was part of a bigger picture, uh, which had to do with the fact that college tuition was rising at twice the rate of inflation. Students were dissatisfied with the education they were getting. And overall, you know, there was a much bigger issue going on with higher ed than simply the federal student aid programs. And at the same time, I had started to write for Fast Company, which was a magazine about innovation and technology and disruptive social change. And so I started to think about a book that would talk about both the problem and the solution. So Anya, we lost your video. I don't know if you oh, camera sorry. on purpose or... No, I didn't. Let me see if I can get it back. Did, could, but did you hear me say all that stuff? You did. We heard it all. I okay. Would, I would have told you if it was not. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to interrupt you if you're fiddling there. I think people uh, enjoy seeing you. Okay. There I we go. I put it back on. I didn't want to watch myself. That's why. So ah, my yeah, that's that's what happened. Off somewhere. Okay. In a corner somewhere. All right. So the that's book fine. is pretty, um, pretty well organized. I mean, Thanks. in fact, it's very organized. So uh, would you mind kind of covering how, you know, sort of how you set the book up and um, and then maybe we'll start with the history? 
Sure, absolutely. So I was really conscious of the fact that generation debt was a long set of complaints, a long litany of complaints, more or less. And I wanted to write a book that was much about solutions as it was about the problem. So I divided the book in half. The first half of the book, I'm essentially talking about how we got here, you know, the history of higher education, the economics of higher education, and what I call the sociology of higher education, which is just this whole idea about college being part of the American dream and representing opportunity for so many people. And then the second half of the book, I start talking about solutions. So I talk about the technology and I talk about it uh, and social media and also, you know, different ways of just approaching the issue of higher education institutions, for, for change from within, change from without, and uh, kind of winding up with this idea of, of your own personal learning path or DIYU. So let's rehearse uh, the, the first part of the book. So the first okay. part is how we got here and the second part is how we get there. Right. right, and that that's going to be an interesting discussion. And, and right. I'm reminded of uh, was it Virginia Woolf who said, "There is no there, there. You know, uh, there is yeah. there, there, there." Right. But, but before we get right. there, um, l why don't you kind of give us this, the, sort of the combination of the history, the sociology, and the economics, and the you know sort of the short version for those who are wondering, you know, what what you uncovered as you kind of drilled down here. Sure. So I started with a pretty simple or seemed simple question, which is how did college degree become part of the American dream, right? It, it hasn't always been that way. It, in fact, you know, the universities date back a thousand years, and for most of that time, people kind of assumed that college was for a very, very small number of people overall. And it's only in the last, let's say, 30 years that we had somehow conceive this idea in America that most people should get a college degree or even that everybody should get a college degree, which is sometimes how we talk about it. And so tracing kind of how that happened, I had to go back to the, you know, the founding of universities, which is really around the, you know, in the United States, which dates back to the earliest days of our history, the sort of the colonial era of colleges. Uh, which matured in the 19th century as America was becoming a great superpower into the birth of this idea of a modern university, the great university, which is what Frederick Rudolph calls them, and John Thielen in his great book. Uh, so the 19th century universities, which were founded with 19th century money, you know, this money of the Industrial Revolution, that combined for the first time the scholastic learning of the, you know, of the medieval era through the 19th century with, this, with the new scientific and technological knowledge that was coming out and sort of built these amazing institutions and the University of Chicago's and the Stanford's. And then the Ivy League schools, which were older, 200 years older, actually had to adopt the great university model. It was that influential. You know, Harvard and Yale had to add their, uh, their science labs and their technology in order to compete with this new idea of the great university. And then speeding up, I'm getting caught in the 19th century here, uh, you know, going in through the 20th century where uh, the federal government really got involved in the post-war era with GI Bill and standardized testing and scientific research again, um, investing in a really big way, that uh, we sort of can see this idea in the post-war era of mass higher education that was going to be delivered through public universities and then public community colleges and come to this issue, this idea of having, you know, education for everyone. Now, did you pause because you wanted to pause in the story or were you ready for me to go on? I'm ready for you to go on. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I grew up on Stanford campus. Uh, my father was a chairman of the college board. Um, you know, I have a lot. I have sort of a lot of history in uh, higher education. Uh, but I feel as though we're rethinking a lot of things uh, in the last um, ten years, and, and, and large institutions are coming under question. So you quote Kathy Davidson and David Thieu on the book, and now I'm going to read that. Our learning institutions, for the most part, are acting as if the world had, has not suddenly, irrevocably, cataclysmically, epistemically changed, and changed precisely in the area of learning. So I want to believe that that's true, and I kind of feel in my heart that it is, but I also feel like we, we run the risk of uh, hyperbole, or that sometimes we kind of get caught up in these changes, and, and like from the 60s and the 70s, that things can go back, it can almost sort of fall back to patterns that we thought were broken and have kind of come back. So for you, how real is this? 
Well, the key for me in thinking about this, Steve, is the idea that yes, there's been an education, there's been an information revolution, and there's been a knowledge revolution, and there's been a communications revolution, obviously, in the way that we communicate and exchange information. But those are not the only things that universities do, right? Universities are not just about knowledge. They're not just about, certainly not just about information, and they're not just about communicating. Um, and so it's all these other functions that university has, universities have historically uh, taken on over the last centuries. And you know, in these fa the last centuries, they have accumulated a lot of functions, right? There's cultural functions, there's political functions, there's very practical functions in our job market of, you know, of giving people degrees and signaling effects and, and you know, really we've handed over to the universities as institutions a lot of the power in our society. And so merely the fact that their central function or the way people think about their central function, which is this information, knowledge exchange, and community, uh, communication community uh, function has been superseded by the internet or has been, you know, really in a, an amazing way uh, taken over in some ways by the internet doesn't mean that the rest of the institutional functions are going to uh, you know, fall away somehow or be magically reorganized. And that's kind of the point that we're at now where people are saying, well, now what? So when Clay Shirky talks about the printing press and the changes that took place after that, and, and you mentioned in the book David Wiley talking about that and others as well, Right. Clay specifically says that there was chaos for 150 right. years afterwards. Can we expect the same kind of chaos, do you think, uh, with regard to higher education? Well, not just with regard to higher education. I mean, I think we're living in a time of, of notable chaos right now in terms of where is the authority in our society, right? I mean, that's that's the fundamental question that's raised by the Reformation, and it's the fundamental question that's raised today, which is, you know, companies are wondering, you know, I no longer have control over my, over my messaging because people can get on Twitter and give the lie to whatever my PR people have to say. And uh, and governments are worrying because, you know, the revolution started in the street, but they're also augmented by SMS and they're augmented by Twitter. And, uh, you know, and universities are worrying because their authority in some senses, you know, if you walk into a classroom, as I have, and the students and the teachers are citing Wikipedia as, you know, a source of information, then where is their monopoly and where is their, you know, safe place to stand? So I would say, yeah, I mean, we are living in a time of, of chaos. So I'm reminded of the passengers on the airplane who were able to tweet that they'd been abandoned on the tarmac for a certain amount of time and, and how, and like you're saying, that commercial messages can no longer be untruthful, just uh, repeated over and over again because the audience now has voice. And, I, and I'm also sort of struck by what I think the Catholic Church is struggling with, which is that an issue can't just go away anymore. Right. The audience decides how much they want to talk about it and, and how much uh, they, they care about it. Um, and, and I'm thinking about my own personal life in which I used to go to a travel agent, but I now book my own travel. I used to go to a print shop, but I now print my, you know, print my own documents on a color laser jet, no less. Right. So it, it does feel very much to me, although I find myself in this camp of the evangelist, that I will make my own education. Right. And that, that that will dramatically change. But I look at, at the body of people that I interact with on a daily basis and I think, how do we help that 80% or whatever number it is who don't learn autodidactically, who aren't sort of self-motivated learners, what are they going to do? Well, I'm sort of unclear because, I mean, I, people ask this question a lot. And, I, I mean, are you saying given that these changes are going to weaken the public university structure? Are we assuming that they are? No, I guess I didn't mean anything uh, behind the question. M more that I, I wonder if that isn't one of the dilemmas, which is that, you'll have a, that, that, that there are a large number of people for whom printing your own, air, the equivalent of printing your own airplane ticket or printing your own, you know, booking your own airline ticket or printing your own document will be much harder in education. and. Um, you know, kind of uh, asking, I guess, to some, at some level, what do you think will happen? Will we have to shift gears toward helping people learn to become self-learners? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's still a huge role for teachers, 
in that. Okay, let's think about photography for a second, right? In the 19th century, people had to go to uh, a professional photographer in the professional photographer's lair or whatever his, his office was where he worked, and he had a ton of really complicated equipment. He had all this chemical knowledge of chemicals and, you know, technology of different kinds. And, you know, and if you were, if you were to take that person and say, well, in 100 years, everyone's going to be making their own photographs by the thousands, then that person would say, that's impossible. How could the average person afford all this equipment, and how would they be able to ever have the knowledge or expertise to do what I do, which is make these really composed formal photographs that require all these different steps? Well, the reason we don't have, the reason that it works today is that it is a thousand times easier to make your own photographs with a digital camera than it was for that guy in the 19th century. It's not even something that we think of as being specialized knowledge. It's something that a child can do, right? And so what happens with technological change is that things become so easy to use and so intuitive because they're made by really smart people, right, along the way. Uh, a lot of thought and design goes into these objects that then we can pick up and interact with and they make our lives so much easier. The work is totally invisible. And so the analogy with education is, no, you can't set up your, you know, you can't, everyone can't act as their own faculty advisor and curriculum planner and also their own professor and to figure out what they're supposed to be reading and what the syllabus is supposed to be. They can't do it in the unwieldy fashion that we deliver education today. But could there be a gadget, could the iPod, could the iPad be a gadget like a digital camera that is full of, chock full, stuffed of really, really well designed programs and software and interaction devices that allow you to interact with it and make your own educational uh, plan the way people make their own pictures. So it's so interesting you would bring that up for, for me in particular because I wonder about this act that we go through of systematizing, that we, uh, we engage right. actively with material and then we create a system and expect someone else to, to sort of memorize it. And you just, you know, sort of introduce this element of can, we cr can somebody create these really great applications that allow for the, um, you know, the finding of the resources. But I will tell you that the most compelling example for me in the book was the one that starts the chapter, the uh, last chapter, the commencement chapter, where you talk about the yep. students actually out in the act of creation. And that felt to yeah. me like that was kind of the answer. Now, again, I'm, you know, I'm an exaggerator, but you know, that, that like the, the BYU-Idaho example where the students study the yep. material before and then come to class to engage or teach naked. The idea that the, what, what happens is that the university becomes a place of action rather than of passive rece uh, receiving of information, but it's actually the place where the, the information becomes activity where you really would want to be with other people and you would have great educators who would help through that process. Well, some people like to say, you know, it's a way for colleges to do, like especially like the small liberal arts colleges, it's a way for them to do what they say that they do already. Right, which is shape people, which is, you know, create a format for discussion and for to teach critical thinking and for allow for exploration and all this awesome stuff. And, you know, is there a way now for people to take to do the 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 mass part of learning or the general part of learning but on their own more with some guidance and then to come together and do this really fun and cool engaged part of learning like the kids um, down in Mexico that I was talking about. I, I want to skip back to something that someone in the chat window said, which is the idea that yes, people take most of their own photographs, but we also have a lot of professional photographers. And I think that that's a really good point. You know, and we have better amateur photographers too. I mean, we have, you know, the Flickr sort of set of people that are very serious about their photography, even if they do it, um, you know, just on their own or on their own time. And then we also have plenty of people that still get paid. So I wouldn't want to say that it's a complete dis disintermediation, but I think it's a really good image of how technology comes in and changes the way people interact with this certain kind of activity. Yeah, and John Seeley Brown talks a lot about amateur astronomy, and that ends up being yeah. kind of a touchstone as well, which is you have mm -hmm. a spectrum yeah. of involvement, some of which is clearly professional, some of which is clearly amateur. But you have a gradation of activity, and it seems like more and more, like in photography, you you, there's neither just one state or another. There's now this wide range of activity that you can participate in. So um, Allison asks a question about accreditation. And this is intriguing to me because, uh, so my daughter is a, she's actually senior at BYU. So oh, cool. she, well, I, I need to keep saying she's in her fourth year 
because she's <laughs> going to finish up next year. But she's built, uh, I helped her to build a website. She's interested in theater and she's doing theater techniques for students, or for children with autism. And um, she's not getting any support from the traditional structure for her website or the kind of activities. She's actually done two interviews for the kinds of activities she's doing. And I have told wow. her somewhat boldly, I think you're actually going to get more value out of your website and documenting what you're doing than you will out of your degree. Am I overstating that or do you think that's true? You know, I I had uh, to be on TV today and I was talking to my makeup artist and the woman who was doing my makeup and it was sad. She had gra Her son had graduated from SBA, the School of Visual Arts, which is a film school, which costs the same amount of money as Princeton. And he himself had about $100,000 in student loans. And he was making videos on YouTube. Um, and he was making money from the videos. He had, he's gotten some advertisers. And his current plan is basically to get famous on YouTube. Because he has a friend who got famous on YouTube. And it sure would have been nice if he had gotten this whole idea of getting famous on YouTube like before he went to the School of Visual Arts, right? So let's let's use that as an excuse to go back just for a second to the first yeah. part of the book and talk about the money piece. So yeah. really, what's happening, and um, it, you know, what 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 is happening to students, and how much money are they spending, and how does that relate to the bigger story? So I started this book again with this, you know, you know, I I have been talking to students about their loans for a while, and um, college tuition has gone up since 1978 more than any other good or service in the consumer price index. Um, so it's a lot. And it goes up faster than inflation in good times and in bad at public schools and in private schools. And the reason for this, it's, it's manifold. I mean, I, I, I went looking for the reason, and there isn't just one cause. There are so many different interlocking causes. So I mean, we can kind of take them in a spectrum, right? I mean, Jane Wellman at the Delta Project co talks about cost shifting, which is, State, universe, state governments, for a variety of reasons, have uh, decreased their support for public higher education. Rather than cut operating costs, uh, state universities have raised tuition to make up that, that money in their budget. That's one whole set of causes. On the private school end of things, there's been this increasing phenomenon of national competition through the U.S. News and World Report rankings and through national advertising. And you have a lot of colleges that are status seeking that are raising their profile by spending more money because as we know a lot of as, as Kevin Carey points out education sector 75% uh, of the US News and World Report rankings come from either direct or proxy measures of spending per student and exclusivity so the fewer students you let in the more money you spend per student the better you look um, so those are two really big dynamics a third area I bring up in the book is this idea of how student loans have actually fed the increases in tuition. And I would love to go, I wish I could get a number cruncher because I don't have that skill, to go back and actually correlate the increases in federal student loan limits with tuition increases because, and not only that, but the growth of the securitization market because what happened with federal, with student loans, with federal and private, it's just like with mortgages, they were bundled into student loan backed securities and they were resold. And as the market internationally for student loan backed securities grew, you had lenders increasingly getting into the student loan market, marketing private loans directly to students through online ads, $50,000, you know, no FAFSA form, we'll, give it, we'll send it right to you, not to the school. Um, and under the guise of education and helping with education, the student loan lobby became incredibly powerful. They got rid of bankruptcy protection for student loans. And my, so my allegation is that we have sort of a student loan bubble, and the, the student loan bubble fed the tuition growth in the same way that the uh, mortgage bubble fed the housing price bloat in the last couple of decades. All right, and I've, I've heard... So those are, those are my top three. They're, yeah. And they're enormously compelling. And you've, I've heard you comparing what we're going through here with both the real estate bubble and the healthcare crisis. Do right. you want to give the quick sound bite on that? Right, so the real estate bubble, as I just mentioned, this idea of growing debt, a growing market for that debt. So you have a lot of quote unquote money salesmen, right? These are the people that are selling student loans to people. And, this, and the loans feed the tuition. Um, 
And then the healthcare comparison I make, which is a little bit more favorable to education. Both healthcare and education, for basic economic reasons, I'm sorry, that's my cat. <laughs> um, both healthcare and education, for basic economic reasons, they are very they're very heavily dependent on uh, skilled labor. And they're also commodities that people can continue to consume more and more of. There seems to be a bottomless hunger, a bottomless need, demand for both healthcare and education. As people get higher standards of living, they consume more and more. And so both of them tend to be locked into these cost spirals. And the more that we, oh, and the third, and then the other reason that healthcare is like education is that there are these third parties that are cushioning people from from paying for them. And so insurers in the healthcare market and then student lenders in the education market are cushioning uh, people from the direct effect of what they cost. And then you have this phenomenon also where both hospitals and universities don't do uh, the same kind of accounting that, that other businesses do. They can't really tell you how much it costs to educate a particular person. They don't break it down that way. And so uh, the billing is, becomes kind of insane because they bundle all of these services together into one huge thing and they don't ne necessarily let you consume, you know, just what you need. Um, so yeah, that, those are my reasons. You get a little passionate there. <laughs> so uh, I interviewed Martin Bauer. I just wish people would talk about this a little bit more. Yeah. Well, so, uh -huh. okay. So let's we'll, we'll leave Mark, Mark Bauerlein for a moment. So that's one of the things that's really consumed me, which is how do you, how do we begin this dialogue? Because clearly this has to be something that we culturally negotiate, that we figure out together as a culture. Yeah. And and I've and I've told this story before that uh, what I love about the United States Constitution is that it's a framework for decision making, but it's not the decisions. And somehow we're in, locked into this mindset of creating the decisions rather than creating the framework for decision making. Mm, that, that's a great and, distinction. And that we need somehow to push decisions down to lower to lower levels so that people will be engaged. I want to be a part of that dialogue. Uh, and I want to be a part of that discussion. Have you thought of other ways that we can raise the profile of this conversation? Well, I mean, that's why I wrote the book, right. you know. <laughs> that, was my, that was my plan, write the that's book. Right. You've done your part. Yeah, well, I, I tried to put this into, you know, into language that I thought would be accessible. I tried to, you know, tell the story in a way that I thought would be compelling. Um, you know, I brought it out with a mainstream publisher, not an academic publisher, and I decided, you know, I tried to, trying to leverage all of the skills that I have in terms of media platforms to get this into a broader space. The biggest, I think, the biggest opportunity that I see right now that I don't know exactly how to cross into is I really want to talk to students about this. I think that students hold the key to changing how higher education is thought of in this country. Um, and I believe that they have, they certainly understand what the problems are and they definitely have the power and the skills to grasp the solutions. And so what I really, you know, it's great to talk to all of you guys and people that are employed within the education institutions have been incredibly welcoming and supportive of the fact that I'm taking their, you know, I'm kind of shining a window and, and you know, I thought that, you, I could have thought that these, that, that people in your world would be much more dismissive of what I'm trying to do, but they've been incredibly welcoming and open and, and really living up to the whole idea of open education. So I, I thank them for that. But I, I really want to engage this community now in thinking about how do you bring your students into this. Okay, so I see, I'm, I'm just going to imagine that Jackie Gerstein right now is jumping up and down in her chair and others here who, who really have wanted this sort of students to play, helping students to kind of get excited about managing their own there'll be con contact there. So we'll go back to Mark for a minute. So uh, I interviewed Mark Bauerlein from the Dumbest Generation and there's almost yeah. a little bit of a smile in his voice when he talks about it. And, and you know, I, I kind of called him on it and I said, you know, how much of this is hype and how much of this is real? And, and I think Mark truly believes that, um, that things have gotten worse, but I really like how you called him out in the book. <laughs> I don't think there, you know, I don't think there has been this this wonderful period of time that he refers to Shakespeare and you know everybody was the models. At the same time, there's this clear connection between the numbers of students, and isn't that just in and of itself going to delay the pool? I mean, if only 10% of your of your population is going to higher education, you're you're going to have smarter students in higher ed. So what's the percentage now and, and how much has that changed over the last 50 years? 
What's the percentage of people going into higher education? Well, yeah, and I, and I know you, I don't mean to put you on the spot. But, but no, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Just, it dropped you have out a little bit. In the so book about basically, half. yeah. So I think it's I think it's three quarters of the people who actually graduate high school enroll in some sort of higher education. Something like seventy to seventy-five percent. Once they graduate, they enroll in some kind of higher education. Um, of course, we lose. Now, I never like the the numbers are very complicated, but we like only we have about seventy a seventy percent graduation rates and uh, from high school in this country. So then, of those people that graduate high school, seventy five percent enroll in some kind of higher education. Um, people in their twenties, I've heard about fifty percent have some college experience, and that's may or may not be degree. Um, Forty four percent of people who uh, enroll in a four year college program have graduated six years later. And when we wrap it all up, people in their 20s, late 30s, up to the late 30s, about 38% of them have some kind of college degree. Wow, and so I'm those are you have kind those. of interlocking over. <laughs> I'm stunned you have those statistics at your fingertips. Well, Very I'm sure people done. will fact check me because that's why we're in a, a live chat, right? Right. Uh, and Leonard, who's speaking next week or the week after, is. Um... So there, there are a couple of sort of interesting. Trends. One of which is more kids starting college, right? Right. So a higher percentage, but also a large number not finishing. Right. So I'm again generalizing, but it's sort of fascinating to see that now the sense that you really have to be in college. And in last week, I interviewed uh, Robert Epstein, who wrote this tome called Teen, Two, and and a, you know it's all about uh, adolescence and the like. And right. the sense that we've now extended adolescence to age 26 with the idea that you don't become an adult until you're much older. So there's something very interesting going on. Well, I mean, I got involved in the Generation Wars with my first book, and now I'm going to be 30, so I can't really, I'm, I'm about to be, you know, cross the bridge where you can't trust anyone. Um, but, you know, I argued in, in Generation Death that a lot of that extended adolescence is really economic in nature, and the fact is that people can't be independent because they're economically not independent. Um, so I don't really see it as being. I mean, are you? What is that? What does that mean exactly? If you say that that, that adolescence has extended until age 26. Well, I think in his case, he's actually saying that this is unhealthy. Right. Buffer period of time when. They don't yeah, have to have responsibility. Okay, yeah, it is unhealthy, but they psycho like they psych they turn it into a psychological phenomenon when actually it's an economic phenomenon. I mean, if you have someone who's forced to be economically dependent, then they're not going to have the same you know confidence in themselves than as someone who has been working for themselves and has been making a lot of money. But is that because? there's something that this generation is weak and there's something wrong with them, or is it because we don't have the right jobs and the right education levels? I think the two of you would agree. I don't think yeah. there's a mismatch in the information. And I think he right. would say that what we've done is, you know, because of these factors, we've created this period of time, and a lot of times out of really good intentions, but we essentially infantilize our teenagers. Right. They end up producing the very thing we don't want them to do. They become our fear of what they will be. And right. I think the messages are very similar. Right. So so I think it's just interesting that because it is a part of this larger story. I mean, clearly you have a, a large group of students who go to college who don't feel successful and have spent right. a lot of money not feeling successful. Yep. Well, yeah, oh. and the core, yeah. No, Sorry, go, go, on. go on. Well, the corollary to that is as the average age of a college student in America creeps up and the percentage that are actually working adults um, I think is almost 40% now. Um, we actually have a great opportunity. A lot of the people who I've talked to who are looking at this problem from the point of view of economics and workforce development say, you know, we have this huge low-hanging fruit opportunity of people who have some college and have also some life experience. And if we just make more on-ramps and make the system more flexible, we have this amazing opportunity to increase our education level as a, as a society. If we destigmatize it and say, hey, you know, have some kind of educational amnesty where you don't have to use the term dropout anymore. You have this opportunity now to come back and to finish your degree. And the only re way for us to do that is to make it easier for people to get credit for life experience, credit for prior learning, and to roll this up into a program that makes sense. You give a great example in the book, and it's not at my fingertips. What's that? 
based on your competence, you can actually test and get credit for skills that oh. you have already attained? Well, I mean, I guess there's a, I mean, WGU, Western Governors, is all assessment based. You can get a whole degree theoretically. I mean, they had a guy who came in who was a computer programmer and he got his bachelor's degree in six months because he just took all the assessments. He already knew all this, all the material. Um, and then Excelsior College in New York is another sort of leader in this idea of, of competence-based and, and prior learning-based assessments. So I hear. Okay, so we're about four minutes away from turning to Q&A. Um, I, I, if, you, if you're willing, I'd like to kind of look to the future. And um, um, I've got my book open, to, for those who have a copy of the book, to pages 130 and 131. So I really felt like for me, this was a great way in which you describe, here's what you know. Oh, look at the cover of the book. It just happened to show up in the video. So, you know, you say, here are some things that I know. <laughs> here are some things that I know for sure. And I, and I like that because it kind of gives this sense of, okay, we're not really sure where the future is going to go, but here's some things I think we can say we know. And I will tell you that the one sentence of Google getting involved in education, I almost fell out of my chair <laughs> because it actually made so much sense to me. I mean, right. Am I the only one who's reacted that way? I'll tell you a secret. My husband works for Google, <laughs> and I was talking to him the other day, and he's looking for a new project. And I was talking to him the other day, and I said, "Why don't we go in and start Google University? We're so close. It's so close to happening." I had to turn my mic off. I was laughing so hard. Sorry, I, 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 but it doesn't. That's a secret. That's just between all of the oh, forty-six yeah, of us. Very yeah. secret. Just, just like Ming's memo a couple of weeks ago was a secret. Right. Exactly. So, um, but I actually felt like that wasn't too far-fetched. It's because not. What Google has done so brilliantly is to give us tools, and and people use the tools for a variety of, of really interesting purposes, and and you could see where they represent this enormous force for change. Right. Society. Um And, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll just well, say because of, I, go ahead. You go. No, no, please. I'll be I brief. <laughs> so go ahead. I, I look go. at Android. I look at Android and I think, this is brilliant. I mean, yeah. they're doing what, the, what happened in the PC before. My Android phone, I actually would be sadder if I lost my Android phone than if I lost my netbook. And I just see the Android becoming this incredible platform because of openness. And I'm thinking, brilliance in what they do. Now your turn. I like to point out that all a lot of these internet companies have educational sounding missions, like to organize and make accessible the world's information. And then um, the guy, the Twitter guy, called it, you know, an information network. And Wikipedia obviously is an you know, it's an like I don't know exactly what their mission statement is, but it's an encyclopedia. So. It's interesting, and oh, and recently I interviewed the the one of the founders of Howcast, which is an instructional video company, and they said that how to is you know consistently one of the top five searches on Google, and so it, it's funny because we don't think of these things as being education related, and I think because there's a mental block where anything that's interesting that people pursue out of their own interest and excitement is not learning, and anything that is boring and hard and official and about regulations and passing tests is what we put in the category of education. And it's a tried observation, but I think, I mean, often we don't really, we don't really realize that. Okay, I'm going to give a shout out here to Alec Koros, who's joined us, and he's in the book several times. Yeah. Alec, good to have you here. Okay, we're now going to switch to Q&A. And if you would like to ask a question using the microphone, use the icon at the bottom of the participant window, the hand up arrow. Be sure to test your microphone in advance. But also leave a question in the chat and we will look for it. So, and now you are vying for a stencil, one of some number of stencils that Anya is going to give away. The Limited DIY edition, signed. Limited edition. <laughs> okay, so Anya, John Becker asks, what do your parents, the professors, think of the book? Um. They have been really receptive. They were a little bit, you know, worried at first. And, you know, my father has retired now. He's been teaching. He taught for 25 years. And we're actually, I think we're, we might do an event together um, later on in the month. But overall, you know, it, considering that they come from within the system and they owe their entire careers to this system, uh, they've been surprisingly receptive. 
Greg asks, uh, in order to prepare students for DIY reality, don't high schools need to rethink their existence and how they structure themselves and what Oh, happens? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I don't think high schools, I don't think your average high school as it's currently set up is really optimized, let's say, for this. But, it, you know, I think that there's, there's room for it to happen within the public system. I think that, you know, all that's really required, and I, you know, I was in an event today with a bunch of kids from a school in Harlem, and, you know, they're working half days, and they're working while they're going to school already in high school, and they have a lot of real life concerns and really practical quests for information. And so I think that what's required, once again, is sort of giving students their heads and letting them, you know, like you give a horse their head, and letting them steer it. And I think we'd be surprised at how easily they take to this kind of learning. Jackie's jumping up and down again. Uh, and that's one thing you didn't mention about BYU Idaho, and I just happened to know this because I took uh, yeah. one of the children there to see the school, and they have a really strong emphasis on working. You, oh, they have the, it's the year-round school, and their expectation is that you know that you will actually maybe go to two semesters out of the four in the year, right. and the other two you're you're in internships, and they make it possible for you to be in those programs during times when other students. Work. So a lot of students take summer classes in order to. Right. That seems well, to be I, pretty critical. I think. I mean, I talk a lot about the distance learning, but I I wish that I could have spent more. T I mean, if I had another three months, I would have written all about experiential education because I think it's this it's the invisible complement. And when I talked about it in one of my um, one of my presentations, as I said, what happened to music? Did it all go on the iPod? No. Artists make their money from live shows, and people actually go to more live shows now than they used to. And so the digitization of the music industry is actually the digitization plus liveization of the music industry. And the same thing should happen to education, where you have what is digital is digital, and then what you can only get in person, you only get in person, whether that's a really awesome classroom experience or it's a really awesome volunteering, traveling, interning experience. And that's a key part of the whole idea. We had a question that's now disappeared from the chat, but it was, I think, is there a recognizable tipping point? Something is you're it, thinking about where you will say, oh, we've turned the corner here. Well, I know that, uh, I think it's Fred Wilson of Union Square Ventures posted a job, uh, a job posting where it was LinkedIn profile and Facebook profile only, no resume. And this is this idea of, you know, you have an online portfolio instead of a diploma. And I would love to see, I mean, obviously there's areas, there's, there's huge areas of our economy that you don't need a college degree to be very successful in. And, you know, technology, entrepreneurship, you know, entertainment are three. Um, but I would love to see someone in government who was self-taught or who was, you know, had a DIYU education. I think that's sort of a, I tried, I wave this flag, I say, you know, yes, yes Obama is the first African American president and that's great, but, you know, Harry S. Truman was the last president with no college degree. How, you know, when are we going to get a president who has, you know, taught himself or herself? Or a homeschooled president. A homeschooled president. How about if I, yeah, exactly. Hey, uh, so Student Force says, and I'm sure you have very little to say on this, any thoughts on e-textbooks, college bookstores, publishers, et cetera? Um, I think that they're kind of the first, the first rank of this because it's such an obvious thing and it's also something where, I mean, you know, I, I talk about thought world knowledge in the book. Uh, you know, students have some choice as to the format of their books and then professors have the choice as to adoption. And it's something I think that's going to grow much faster than expected because there's so many different cases for it. So I see it as like, and just like, uh, you know, I talk about with Judy Baker, it's like e-texts are the Trojan horse. They're the first thing that comes in and then people realize all the possibilities that are available with the Internet. So I did an interview a few weeks back with a guy who's an investor in education. Sort of stunningly evident that many of the things that we're talking about that we see as being most valuable are not the ones that are driving. They're not the ones that are. No, I mean, he's very interested. He feels that large money will come into education when it's top-down standardized. And I'm in the K-12 arena. But I, th I think some of us have a, uh, a hesitancy to see the innovation coming from the merchants. 
talk about some, you talk about community colleges at length in the book. And there's one particular example where a large number of those community colleges are getting together to produce textbook material. Is it likely that there's going to be some flexibility in what community colleges do so we would innovation coming out of the community? Are we going, sorry, Steve, I lost the end of your question. Oh, seeing innovation uh, come out of the community college arena because it's more flexible. Um, I would hope so, and not only that, but they have such a you know they have a huge need for it. But it, you know they're they're also the kind of the end of the line in so many ways. I mean, I think you know community colleges are serving half of all undergraduates with a third the resources per student at a, as a public university. So you could look at it and say, well, we're going to see innovation here, and I mean. Um, you know, Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovation comes from the fringes. We could see it at community colleges, uh, and we're certainly seeing attempts at that. We also, I think the, it would be interesting to look at what's happening overseas, because they're dealing with the same problem, except by orders of magnitude. And I had a really interesting conversation with an educational technologist who's uh, in at South by Southwest, who's transferring to South Africa, because he says, you know, they're basically building a university system from scratch over there, and so they have a, a true green field for innovation. Okay, so remember you are vying for stencils, DIY stencils. If you've got a question you'd like to ask by audio, be our first, raise your hand. Question in the chat. Alec, can I put you on the spot? Would you like to say hi? I know you know how to use a limit. Alex says, no mic, darn. OK, so if I missed a question, please repost it. That chat has flown by quickly. Yeah, it is hard to watch both the chat and to listen. I OK, so uh, Rurik Rory says, I don't know if you've seen the iPad app with the periodic table. Do you see academic text moving into an interactive experiential? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think absolutely it will, but it depends on you know exactly where you're experiencing it. Because if you're reading stuff on your iPhone, um, you might want it to be just text-based. Or what if you're getting an SMS you know course that you're taking and you're like in Kenya somewhere, right? So it has to be suited to the medium that you're in. Cindy says, I'm interested in faculty buy-in. How will faculty accept this proposal? I'm not sure, Cindy. I know what proposal that is. Do you? Anya? No. Mm -mm. So uh, Matt says he has to go. Makes him, him actually want to read your book even more. And I'll say the same thing, which is uh, this is a book I thoroughly loved and know that I will reread. Thank you. I get Thank to you. invite all these new people to the interview. Great. OK, Chris has a question there. Have you seen any kind of learning maps already with learners having the ability to bring um, sources, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you mean as terms of like a, a, a program or a software program? Or what? So Chris, go ahead and um, put your Elaborate, please. there. Or feel free to raise your hand, and I'll give you the Yeah, there's this question about accreditation, too, that I want to pick up. Um, and I wrote a blog post about it uh, last week. And I don't want to discount the fact that I think it's the biggest issue that's remaining and what you know Alec calls it the holy grail, right? Which is this idea of how do you get people to validate the kind of learning that goes on informally in communities. Um, and one answer is that you form new communities. So you you know, and I bring up the the example of Behance a lot, which is a place where people who do visual um, any kind of visual work can upload their portfolios and have them voted on by a community. And as reputation systems get better on the internet, we already put a ton of trust into reputation systems on the internet for things like buying books or buying uh, shoes or you know buying cars. We we trust generally what people say, what anonymous random people say on the internet, or even choosing a hotel, which is kind of a commitment, right? You go across the country and or across the world, and you go to a hotel because somebody wrote down that it was a good hotel, right? So reputation systems, they are going to grow and be more important. I don't think there's going to be one, one single reputation system that's going to replace the college diploma. 
but I think that there's going to be a lot of different communities that are going to sprout these kinds of reputation systems. Um, so that's one answer. Another answer is, you know, will the accreditation system directly be attacked and be kind of, and this is a huge piece that I wish that I had written and that I left out of the book, which is how does accreditation work on the institutional level and who are these crony-like groups, right, of people that work for other institutions that go and check out your institution by a list of qualitative reasons and tell you, you know, say that it's okay that this is an accredited institution. Um, so that's sort of a, uh, you know, a big kind of unsolved question. Um, I think it's interesting because a lot of times when you talk about change in higher education, you have to talk about the status quo in higher education, which is this large unexamined mass that is used to not being looked at too carefully. And so, um, all I can say is there is that there's a lot of meat and there's a lot of uncovered territory for a reporter that wants to continue to be on this well, topic. Well, I'll tell you that my own brother, who is a in a in to collaborate with others, Paul almost has to completely buy in. So it sounds like I broke up there in my back. So my brother, who's a university professor, says that uh, for him, there's no incentive for him to uh, to collaborate in, in terms of getting tenure. He actually has to work on his own, and it has to be uh, an isolating experience. And he feels very much like that works against everything that we're talking about. Does yeah, yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> and you know. People figure out ways to collaborate. Like this whole open education movement is formed of faculty members who are collaborating across silos and institutions because it's so damn important to what they want to do and what they care about. And so I think that people really can't be stopped. And you know, institutions that can't figure out how to take advantage of people's desire to collaborate and work together are not going to be successful. OK, last chance to ask Anya a question. I've got two minutes to go. You can raise your hand using the hand with the green up arrow and take the mic, although no one's been brave enough to do so now. I think you're intimidating. One or person you can did. Your, One person did. You can put your question in the chat. And I don't know how you're going to determine who gets the, uh, the stencil, although you can My go through the chat decide. log. Your cat's going to decide. Oh, so uh, Anya, what's next for you? I read in your blog that that, that uh, someone had actually made some kind of an offer to you. Uh, Not an offer, just an exhortation. Ah, so so what is next? Is there a way that we can help you? Is there a way this community, these kind of live events, or something we can do to make a difference for you? Yeah, invite me to come speak at your campus to students. Okay, that's going to have to be somebody else since my campus you've seen exists of a single room in Lincoln, California. That's fine. But, but Anya is saying she wants to speak, so that's good to know. And do you want to put your email or um, Twitter information in the chat there? Sure. Monica says she's inviting already. Monica and I are, are Seth Godin fans. That uh -huh. ties us together. Cool. Awesome. And you're, you're going to have to probably email her to get her right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Alex on board. Okay, this has been a lot of fun. Anya, thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much. This has been so fun, really. It, 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 you've been a terrific guest. Uh, thanks again to Illuminate My Employer, Learn Central, and the C. Bloom and Associates who pay my book bill. And coming up next week, John Taylor Gatto. And if you don't know who he is, do read, him, do read about him. Uh, he said a lot of things that have been said lately, but, but decades ago. Um, and, and fun coming up, including uh, Kathy Davidson, who's mentioned in the book, as we talked about. And we're hoping to get Shell Israel back on. He had to he had to postpone because of a family issue. We haven't heard back from him, but hoping to have him come back on. So this is Steve Harganon. You've been at Future of Education with Anya Kamenetz. Did I do it right there? Anya Kamenetz. And talking about her book, DIYU, the last screenshot, Anya. Show us the cover of your book again. Hopefully, we'll, it will, in, will add slightly to your Amazon ranking tonight. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for a great show. Thanks, Anya. Bye. You can use the clapping hand there to clap for her. <laughs> so, Anya, I don't know what it would take to, to 
wrangle you into co-hosting some interviews. But if that idea ever comes up and you think okay. that it would have value, let me know because I'd love to do it. And, let me look um, at your schedule again. That sounds like fun. I want to sit, sit in for John Taylor Gatta, but I'm not 100% sure I can because I'm going to be... But um, yeah, let, just let me know. Well, I am going to take the book and go through and contact a lot of the people in the book and talk to them. And so Great. if there's a way to have that be publicity for the book, feel free to, you know, maybe you could send me a slide or if you were going to be available, you might want to come in and uh, participate. I definitely want to do Dennis Lipke. I love him. Yeah, and Dennis actually had to postpone as well and I haven't okay. heard back when he's going to come back on. But he's mentioned in the book, as are so many others, so many great folks. Yeah. We could do a whole DIYU yeah. series. Yeah, you know. You never know. Just let All me right. know. It has to fit your needs. Okay. Thanks for coming, everybody. In order for the recording to process, we actually have to have you quit the room. But this was a fun night, and uh, thanks for being on video, Anya. To close okay. out, you just click on the X at the top right or go to File and Exit. I'm going to stop the recording, and if you're not gone in a minute or two, I will bump you out. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.